didn't tell Rupert that, but now he knows, doesn't he? <laughs> hey, horror fans. I am Nell Tigerfree from The First Omen, and I'm here to answer some burning questions. For folks who haven't seen the movie yet, can you tell them who you play and what the movie's about? Yes, I play Margaret, who is the protagonist of The First Omen. She is a young American woman, and she comes to Rome to become a nun uh, under the guidance of Cardinal Lawrence, played by Bill Nighy, who is like her father figure. And she very quickly uncovers a dark conspiracy to bring about the birth of evil incarnate. When was the first time you actually watched the OG Omen movie. I was actually 11, so I was uh, sneaking off to watch horror films at my next door neighbor's house and uh, greatly enjoyed watching things that were wildly inappropriate for my age range, uh, unbeknownst to my parents. <laughs> I mean, I was 11, so my reaction was pretty visceral, but I've returned to that original so many times, like even before I was attached to this film and my reaction's always been the same. I think it even got stronger as I got older and I sort of understood the themes a little bit more. It's always been one that stayed with me. I'm such a big fan of the genre that you kind of can't not love the omen. If you love horror, they kind of go hand in hand. So your director is totally ambitious in the vision and storytelling that she chose yeah. here. How did she help unlock your own performance in the movie? She kind of nurtured me like a little baby bird. I mean, when you meet Akasha, she just has this energy where she's just going to hold you and she's just going to keep you safe. And that's kind of a thing that everybody experiences with her, certainly all the other cast members. And it's like the way that she speaks to you, it's like she's actually listening. Like a lot of the time when you speak to somebody, it feels like they're just waiting for their turn to speak but Kasha will forget that she even can speak because she's just locked in and she really wants to know everything you have to say and she values everything that you have to say. And I felt that in the audition, you know, I felt already like it was collaborative when I hadn't even been given the job yet. So I was excited. And then after I spent day one on the set, I was thrilled. Like we just married together so nicely and I knew kind of straight away that I was gonna trust anything that she asked of me. I think you can tell in this movie I would literally do anything that she asked of me. What was your reaction when you first read the script and saw some of the scenes that were gonna come up? Well, some of the scenes when I initially first read the script weren't actually on the page. Or if they were on the page, they were like very truncated versions of what actually ended up being in the film. There's like a specific moment when I come out of a car and that actually wasn't written. It was like written as one sentence and so I couldn't really foresee what it was gonna turn into. And yeah, there were some shots that weren't even scripted and we I kind of found out like through word of mouth that they were gonna be happening. And then you come to it on the day and it was like, I wasn't surprised and I wasn't shocked because I'd spent enough time with Kasha by that point. And also because it just felt natural. It felt like these things weren't there just for shock value or to be gratuitous or anything like that. They just made sense to the story and they lent themselves massively to what we were trying to say. So. I was just like, yeah, let's let's go. <laughs> the one scene where you're possessed and yeah. do a little bit of like, I want to say like a thriller dance a little bit, like with the body <laughs> yeah. movements, it's amazing. How did you prep for that? You know what, honest to God truth, I didn't. Um, it was something that we just wanted to give a go and see what happened. We didn't have a choreographer or a, like a movement coach. We didn't have any of that. Uh, we didn't actually rehearse it. All I had was this just one uh, reference that Kasha gave me from this movie, Possession. And I just watched that clip once or twice and kind of understood the energy that she wanted. And we had a lot of conversations about it. We just sat down and like talked about it for, for ages. And right from day one, it was the first thing that we spoke about was the scene because I didn't really understand like the beast it was going to become. And uh, I quickly realized how important the scene was to Kasha and how important it was to the movie. And thus it became incredibly important to me. So. We just chatted about it a lot and then we gave it a go. It was all one one take and yeah, it was, uh, it was good. The first take is the one that we used, which was pretty cool. So it was, a, it was a good day. It was like five in the morning, so I was feeling deranged anyway. When you watch it, what part of it are you most proud of? Wow, that's a good question. I'm English, so it's very hard to compliment myself. Um, you know what, I'm just proud of like the collaborative ex like experience that like came together to make the scene what it was. It was like a controversial thing to 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 pitch and to sell. Like, hey, we're just gonna have this girl convulsing for like seven minutes. Is everyone cool with that? Like, and it was a hard thing for Kash to, to sell and, and for it to be able to happen. And I think I'm just proud of the fact that like, how visceral it is and how animalistic and, and how kind of like oppressive it is. And it, it ended up in the movie almost in its entirety. So I'm proud of the people that, that fought for it afterwards. <laughs> That's what I'm proud of.
and you teach IMDb fans how to perfect the perfect horror scream? Well, I mean, I don't know if I've perfected how to do it safely. I never used to sound like this. I actually had a much higher voice. <laughs> now I sound like I've been smoking for 40 years. <laughs> I think it would be better to ask like a screamo singer, musician, how to, I should probably ask one how they do it without <laughs> being able to speak the next day. Just a lot of herbal tea as well keeps you safe. And um, the scream should come from the stomach. It shouldn't come from the throat. It's like singing a little bit. Like you have to support your scream, otherwise you're only gonna get one. And uh, as people probably have learned, you need more than one scream to make a movie like this. How many takes did you need for your big screams? Which one? I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many. I think the, the, the biggest scream I did maybe four or five times. But overall, I think I probably screamed like 150 times making this movie, because I like, she screams a lot. A lot of bad stuff happens to this girl. Are you up for giving <laughs> us an example of a scream? I was, can you hear my voice? I've been talking for five days. You're gonna kill me. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Besides the first Omen, what is a horror movie that really scares you? Um, the original It with Tim Curry as Pennywise. I'm terrified of clowns. Um, so I seek out the most intensely terrifying clown movies I can possibly find to try and like kick this fear. It's like a, like extreme exposure therapy. Um, it has not yet worked. I will let you know if it does. Um, but yeah, the original It. I watched that one when I was like 10. And it just stayed with me. There's this one shot that I will never be able to look at a washing line the same way ever again. It's like the sheet moves and he just pops out from behind it. And now I'm scared every time I do my washing. So the movie was shot in Rome. Yeah. What was one Italian phrase you learned that oh. you find most handy? I've been waiting for this question. I have been practicing this. This was like the one sentence that I used the whole time and it was, posso avere un altro bicchiere di vino bianco? Which means, can I please have another glass of white wine? <laughs> Are you guys impressed? I'm impressed. That's pretty great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Posso avere un altro bicchiere di vino bianco? All right, so the movie is not only shot in Rome, but also set in the 70s. What style or fashion trend from that wonderful decade do you want to bring back? I want to bring back the YSL-inspired nuns costume, which was actually my costume. And I also have these like knee-high lace-up leather boots. My costume was inspired by like a YSL 70s runway look. And I just felt like the chicest nun in the world. It was just fantastic. Also, Bill Nye, his costume was given to him by the Vatican's Taylor. So his is like the real deal. And I think he looks fabulous in it. And I think that it's a color he should rock more often, personally. Is it more fun to play a novice nun or an unhinged nanny? <laughs> um, I don't know if fun is the right word for either of them. I think I've probably been closer to an unhinged nanny in real life when I've had to babysit and things like that. But novice nun, this was the first one for me. So I'd have to say that was more interesting to explore because it's not something I think I'll ever be able to experience in real life. I don't think they'd have me. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Servant here. You got to play Leanne Grayson for four years. What was it like to grow with that character while you were also growing yourself? That experience was very formative for me and it was, it was really important, I think, to who I am now. And I learned a lot of things on that show. I learned how to say no. I learned how to, like, you know, respect myself a little bit more and I learned from Lauren and Toby and Rupert what it means to be gracious and kind and also be super talented and uh, I stole a lot of their tricks. I learned so much from M. Night. He kind of got me out of a couple of bad habits that I picked up because I'm kind of just winging this whole thing. I, I didn't study or anything so I uh, just kind of hope for the best all the time um, and just pray that people keep hiring me but Knight just taught me to trust myself a little bit more and to be more grounded in the show and then that kind of trickled into who I became as a I feel like I went from a girl to a woman to be honest with you without the risk of sounding very cheesy but yeah it was kind of like my university for me really weird creepy university for the first time in my life I was happy so you mentioned Rupert. In an interview a couple years back, you said that everyone's first crush is Ron Weasley or someone from oh Harry Potter. Oh gosh, I did. bloody did. I know. Did you tell Rupert that? No, I didn't tell Rupert that, but now he knows, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Listen, I was very young, okay. It was actually my best friend Florence. So she, he was like her first love, really. She was just gonna kill me, oh my God. <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like everyone's like, first crush was Ron Weasley. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rupert, but you know. 
It's gone now, don't worry. But back in back in the day, we all loved we all loved a bit of Ron Weasley. <laughs> Did you let him know you were such a huge fan of the franchise? No, but he knew. Come on, of course he did. You know who really let him know was Toby. On the first day, Toby was like, Rupert, man, I love your work, I've got to say. It's just so funny looking back on that and then like four years later seeing all of our relationships and how they were at the end of the show. Like, of course, when I first met Rupert, I was like, oh my God, like it's Ron Weasley, like I'm so excited. And then like, you know, four years go by and it's like, it's just Rupert. <laughs> I've made my peace with how things are. You should too. What house are you in? Oh, I did the test. I did the test and I'm a uh, Hufflepuff. Even though I was obviously, I was hoping for Gryffindor, but um, <laughs> You know, what can I say? Let's talk about another show that you were in, Game of Thrones. What scene from that show are you most proud of? When I was shot that show, I was like, just so insecure and was terrified of looking at myself. My mom did make me watch my death scene though, and I was little, I was like, yeah, that's such a weird <laughs> sentence. <laughs> um, I was little though, I was 14, and uh, I was proud of that. It was a nice moment, that little bit, where it's like, I know you're my dad, and it was sweet. And then they kill me in classic Game of Thrones fashion. <laughs> So there are a couple of Game of Thrones alums in the movie. Oh yeah, big time. Do you guys have any special moments on set? Yeah, I mean, well, Ralph and I are like best friends now. Like I, I love that man. He's like the, a teddy bear. He's like the sweetest, kindest person on the planet. Um, if you see the movie, you'll understand that there's probably a reason why I didn't meet Charles. But somebody really alarmed me. They were like to me, Nell, your granddad's here. I was like, where? Like, what do you mean my granddad's here? And then I quickly realized that Charles is technically my grandfather in Game of Thrones. But for a moment, I thought that like my Papa John was like hiding around somewhere in Rome. So that was funny. <laughs> you also star in another movie called Wonderwell, which includes the great Carrie Fisher. What is the best memory you have of working with her? What's the funniest thing she said to you? Oh my God, like everything that she said was hilarious. My favorite memory actually was, uh, we came into the makeup trailer and Carrie was getting her like wig and her makeup done. And uh, she was fast asleep and her Coke can, cause she always had a Coke in her hand and her Coke can was just like teetering on the edge of spilling everywhere. And like every time someone would try and remove it from her hand, she'd be like, <laughs> and like wake up and then just like drink it and fall back asleep, which was hilarious. Also, we got to celebrate her 60th birthday all, all together. It was great. And I was like sneakily smoking at the time without my mom knowing. And like Carrie came and got me. She was like, Nell, let's go to the window and have a cigarette. And it was it was great. It was great. I loved it. She was just really, really cool. Like as cool as you would hope she would be. Which is true. What is a special skill you have that we should add a credit for? I'm not particularly skilled. Oh, no, I can do an impression of um, Gollum from Lord of the Rings and Cartman from South Park, which I used to do on dates and wonder why they never called. <laughs> yeah, isn't it the damnedest thing? Which one should I do, Gollum or Car I'll do Gollum. Evil <laughs> hobbits. Frodo beats the wind. There you go. Can't believe that's on tape now forever. <laughs> Always watching. What musician are you the biggest super fan of? Dave Grohl. Mm -hmm, so much. Um, I have a Foo Fighters tattoo. My dad really got me into them when we were little. We have matching Foo Fighters tattoos. Would you ever want to perform with Dave or the Foo Fighters? I would sell, I wasn't, I was about to say I'm asked to sell my soul and I think that would start, <laughs> judging by the film. <laughs> I would I actually do anything. Like I would, I would do anything to do that. Uh, yes, is the short answer. I'm not really keeping it cool, am I? I'd have to like keep it really cool if I met him. I would pass out and I would die. Boom! What's the best piece of advice you received early on as an actor that has stuck with you? Um, this is actually true. I, I not that I was planning on saying something that wasn't, but. Um, <laughs> Energy-wise, if you think I'm a bit like erratic and frantic now, you should have met me when I was younger. I, I had so much raw energy, and I because all I wanted to do was impress and please and do the best job possible. But it came out as like this unstable kind of nervousness, and it was a bit of a deterrent when I would go into the room and audition because people couldn't focus on my performance because they were focusing on the fact that I was talking a million miles an hour and you know sweating profusely. And some of that is nerves, but also some of it is just being centered. And I started booking jobs when I. I would walk in telling myself that I'd already gotten it. And I would walk in and I would just take a few deep breaths and I would go, okay, you have a personality and it's good to show parts of it, but don't reveal too much of yourself because you want them to feel like they need you and you don't need them. And um, it was something that I learned quite young and then I implemented it and it, it really did help and it really did change things, just being centered and calm and grounded. And obviously I'm not giving the best example of that right now, but um, yeah, just, 
keeping the attention on you rather than around you. We also heard that you're a big fan of Glee. Oh yeah, big time. What like, I'm a Gleek. What is your favorite Glee episode of all time? That is such a fantastic question. I've been waiting for a question like this. There's many, <laughs> there's many. But I like the Glee episode where Tina falls into a fountain and all of the Glee cast members body swap. I love that. Also the episode with the first sectionals where they get the set list and they realize the competing show choirs have stolen their set list. It's very dramatic. And then Finn comes in and saves the day and he has like a prepared number for them all. And then they win sectionals. Makes me happy to think about it. What is number one song on your Glee playlist? Okay, this is very specific. My number one song on my Glee playlist is Cough Syrup, the cover by Darren Chris. Anything The Warblers, I eat up. Um, also, When I Get You Alone, covered by The Warblers. I just think I would listen to Darren Chris sing the phone book. I honestly do. He's an angel on this earth. Have you met any of the Glee class members in real life? No, I think I would actually pass out and die. So do you want to meet Blaine, like, of all of them? He's not here, is he? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be my number one to me, 100%. Mm. <laughs>